morning. Welcome to this chapel service as we celebrate the accomplishments of our graduates and put um, a period, if you will, at the end of this academic year, at least as it relates to uh, the work within this space, uh, obviously culminating this weekend at commencement. So for all the reasons that you are here and those who are watching online, we welcome you. We offer a special word of uh, understanding and prayer for our president, Jody Hill, who is not doing so well at the moment and in need of some healing prayer. So we are hopeful for his quick recovery, and we want to place that before all who are a praying people this morning. The order of worship is before you in your worship bulletin. I invite you to rise as you are able for the call to worship. Sing to the Lord a new song. Break into joyous songs of praise. And all the earth celebrate and rejoice. For our God comes in victory. With righteousness and justice for all. The hymn is Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. Let us sing.
You may be seated. <coughs> Share with me in the opening prayer. The Lord is with you. Yes. Let us pray. Life-giving God, we find joy in your newness of life through Jesus Christ. Help us to feel the joy of inhaling and exhaling the breath of life in every season. Transform us when we come together as your beloved and diverse creation. Guide us in our praise as we seek your saving love toward a world where there is peace and justice for all. Amen. Let's join together in the litany of thanksgiving for our graduates found in your bulletin. God of every ending and new beginning, you give us moments like this to remember and give thanks. You set us on a journey and walk each step with us along the pathway. We thank you for the courage to undertake this journey and the strength to stay the course. We look back where we've come and find the assurance to keep heading forward. We remember moments of discovery and growth along the way that brought both discomfort and delight. We are grateful that our vision is broader and our devotion deeper than when we first started. Now we stand at the threshold of the next leg of our journey, encouraged by all you have made possible for us. Mark the way into the future and assure us that we will discover you walking before and beside us. And when the way is clouded with uncertainty and fear, remind us that you are behind us to protect and catch us when we fall. By your spirit, fill us with joy and believing that our next steps will lead us to the promised new creation where Jesus is ready and waiting for us to arrive. May your justice, mercy, and kindness fill and empower each of us to fulfill your calling in our lives. All glory and praise belong to you, Creator God, our Rock and our Redeemer, to Jesus Christ, our Savior and Friend, and to the Holy Spirit, by whom we are united with you in eternal life. Thank you, God. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, I invite you to rise for the reading of the Gospel. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Good morning. Last week, I didn't think I'd be standing here, but uh, matter of fact, <laughs> I don't ever expect I'm going to be standing here. But you know, 
it's an amazing thing how God calls us into wherever God calls us to. Um, so before I begin, I uh, again echo uh, with uh, Dr. Jeffers, uh, keep um, Dr. Hill, a president, in your prayers um, as he's ill and not able to be here. As we all know, he would be standing here or sitting there if he was present. Uh, keep him in prayer. And then to the graduates, uh, 2024 graduates of Memphis Theological Seminary, uh, I salute you, and I, uh, whether you're online or you're present, wherever you might be, I salute you uh, in this high moment in, in your life. So today, abide in his love. Um, I'm reminded as I come before you, as I'm often reminded of Karl Barth, who said that uh, the preacher uh, needs to have the gospel in one hand and newspaper in the other hand uh, in order to preach to people even in his time. So in the news uh, these days, and particularly last week, that grabbed me were four things, and they stood out uh, for me in the context of today's gospel reading that we just heard. Two of them were resolutions passed by the General Conference of the United Methodist Church that was convening in Charlotte, North Carolina. A third uh, was the protest for Palestinian people held on various college campuses. And a fourth was the bestowing of the Presidential Medal of Freedom to Megar Evers, uh, who was assassinated by Byron de Lebequit, June 12, 1963. About a 93, by a 93.14% vote, the General Conference delegates of the United Methodist Church approved legislation that opened space for the United Methodist Church to be a more welcoming and inclusive church. General Conference delegates from all over the world voted to remove harmful language to the LGBTQIA persons. The removal of this language makes rooms for, room for differences of opinion and belief to be present in one church, family, and demonstrates hospitality. The action by the United Methodist Church General Conference delegates is a matter of practicing justice to the clergy people who are LGBTQIA. On April 30th, 2024, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church, being held again, is continued to be held in Charlotte, made a groundbreaking call for church investment managers to exclude the bonds of three countries, Israel, Turkey, and Morocco, that are holding subject popula populations under prolonged military occupation. The action by the United Methodist Church General Conference delegates is a matter of justice practiced for those being oppressed. It was the first such divestment action by a major Christian denomination. And in doing so, the UMC Church has called on all its investment managers to avoid the governmental debt of each such country until the time when each government ends their military occupation. Across campus, campuses in the United States of America where protests have broken out, students have called for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and end to U.S. military assistance for Israel, university divestment from arms suppliers and other companies profiting from the war, and amnesty for students and faculty members who have been disciplined or far, fired for protesting. This is a matter of justice, practicing on behalf of the people of Palestine. Megar Evers was a devoted husband and father, a distinguished World II War veteran, and a pioneering civil rights leader. He served as the NAACP's first field secretary in Mississippi, organizing protests and voter registration drives, recruiting new workers into the civil rights movement, and pushing for school integration. He was a fighter for freedom and justice. The gospel reading for this, this Sunday, this past Sunday of, of Easter, sixth Sunday of Easter, extends the image of Jesus as the vine and the disciples as the branches 
that was part of a uh, of this of the scripture that preceded what Dr. Jeffords read. And like any other good discourse or conversation in the Gospel of John, Jesus can't let the metaphor go after only one take. While it may be a bit frustrating for us as readers and interpreters, as Jesus seems to go on and on, it's worth to stick with Jesus. One hermeneutical or way to interpret the passage is a key to John and I discourse is to look for the subtle shift Jesus makes that invites a deeper engagement with the image or the metaphor. For example, in John 6, Jesus uses the bread of life discourse. Jesus modifies that later in John 6 by saying, not only am I the bread of life, I am the bread that came down, comes down from heaven. These deeper levels of engagement of the metaphor are symbol, but reflect narratively the grace upon grace that is in the word made flesh. Like the signs Jesus performs, which are abundant, all over the top in their meaning and results, the symbolic levels of the imagery reflect the abundant love Jesus has for believers. Considering this entire section uh, of, of the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 17, of which we're only looking at verses 9 through 17, but if we look at that entire discourse, similar to the bread of life and the good shepherd uh, discourses, it is a helpful strategy toward appreciating the nuances Jesus makes as he unpacks the meanings of this metaphor for the disciples. The second section of what we shall call the vine and the branches discourse has Jesus moving the image to a new stage of depth and meaning. Whereas Jesus has previously invited the disciples to abide in him as he does earlier in the 15th chapter, he now asks them to abide in his love. The vine and the branches imagery are yet one more depiction of the love shared between God and Jesus into which the disciples are assured. The disciples will desperately need this love in the face of the world's hatred to come that picks up right after this section we just read. And they will experience the same rejection as Jesus when they testify to his love in the world. Jesus predicts that they will be put out of their synagogues and be killed. Whether it is fighting for inclusion, fighting to be free and justice, abiding in Jesus' love is the sustaining force, force that will make possible for their witness. Without it, we'll be most certainly wither and we'll most certainly die. I say to you today that without abiding in Jesus' love, we will all wither and die. Those delegates that made up 93% of all the delegates of the UMC General Conference were abiding in Jesus' love as they opened a door of hospitality. Likewise, the delegates were abiding in Jesus' love as they voted to take a stand against war, violence, and abuse by one group of people against another people. The nonviolent protesters on college campuses are making a similar stance. Megger Evers stood for justice to the point of being killed for his standing. He was abiding in Jesus' love. John 15, 12 is a restatement of John 13, 34 through 35 that was preached on Monday, Thursday in many churches. Love is the hallmark of discipleship in the Gospel of John. And the disciples are to mirror the love that God has for Jesus, that Jesus has for his father, and that Jesus has for his disciples. This love, however, is not an abstract commandment, but has already been embodied in Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. You know, abstraction just allows us to be able to say the words, I love you. They allow us to say, I love everyone. They say, allow abstraction, that there really has no concrete meaning. But Jesus puts concreteness 
to this love when he washes the disciples' feet. Abiding in Jesus' love causes us to take concrete action. As Jesus experienced abundant love when Mary anointed his feet, he then takes the same and takes that love that he experienced and moves it forward into Jerusalem, into the hour, and is able to wash the feet of his betrayer, Judas, and his denier, Peter. Jesus takes Mary's love with him to the garden, his arrest, his trial, the cross, and into the darkness of the tomb. By loving one another, the disciples will carry their love forward in their own losses and their own grief that lies ahead. It is the love that they have for each other that will get them through not only Jesus' absence, but what is to come once they leave the house, cross the Kindron Valley, and enter the garden. It will be that abiding in Jesus' love that will carry graduates from Memphis Theological Seminary, past seminary, into the world to ministry. The community of disciples is commanded to do works of love, but loving one another makes possible loving the world that God loves. God cannot love the world without the love they take into the world. And they will do this embodied love together, just as Jesus has embodied limitless love. They will do it by abiding in Jesus' love. If you watch the movie, I've had watched the movie Selma, you will see again the record of persons who willingly laid down their lives, risking pain and even death for the cause of justice. Truly, they epitomize the meaning of this love of neighbor of which Jesus speaks of in the text. In the second march on Selma, one sees not simply black people or Christians. There were people of many races and cultures and religions. There were certainly people from all walks of life bound together by love. Love of neighbor that made them willing to move out of their comfort zone, certainly aware, based on previous events at that time, that their presence and participation could result in bodily harm or even death. And yet they came to Selma. This is what, it's, this is what it looks like to lay down one's life for one's friends, to be present for each other in times of threat and crisis. Note that Jesus does not say, lay down your life for me, but for your friends. To be Jesus' friend is to be loved by him and then to love as Jesus has loved, to abide in his love. Jesus' words about laying down his life articulate the very real choices that he makes for his own life and then that guide his relationships in the world. This is the nature of Christian love. The love God showed towards Jesus, he showed towards the disciples so that they could show it toward each other. When they love in this way, their love becomes impregnated with divine qualities. It's not just an emotional, cozy feeling, but a conscious decision to put yourself on the line and risk everything for the other. This kind of love will make sure that justice is done in the world. You will venture, you'll, you will venture yourself from the safety of your community into the broader society to see that it is transformed by this sacrificial love that Jesus modeled for us. Cornel West has said that justice is the shape love takes into society. The disciples will have to make real choices for each other in the hours to come and in the days following Jesus' resurrection. The love shown to one another is the love Jesus has shown as he has accompanied his disciples. He loved them to the end, to the full extent of the love. In their love for one another, 
they hold on to and keep experiencing Jesus' love for them. Jesus continues to prepare his disciples for his physical departure. In the verses 1 through 8, he told them that he is the true vine, God's agent, and that they are the fruit. They represent him in the world to bear fruit, to do in his name. This is how God's power will be extended among humans. Jesus has loved them as God has loved them. They are continuing to love him by being obedient to his commandments to continue to be in a loving relationship with God uh, even after Jesus has departed. This is the kind of love that leads to ultimate joy. Jesus is the model for our behavior and Jesus is the one that loves others so much that he gave his life for them. You might be wondering, how do we abide in Jesus's love? We first must grasp that Jesus says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And it is for a few reasons. We have been, first of all, chosen for joy. No matter how hard our life may be, as we abide in Jesus's love, it is both in traveling and the goal, the way of joy. There's always joy in doing the right thing. Disciples of Jesus are people of joy, not people of gloom. We are sinners, but redeemed sinners. Therein lies our joy. And how can we not have joy when we walk with the Lord and abide in his love? Second, we are chosen for love. We are sent out into the world to love one another. We're not sent out to compete with one another or dispute with one another, or even to quarrel or argue with one another. So disciples are to live in such a way that they show the world what is meant by loving our neighbors. We might ask Jesus, why do you demand that we love one another? And Jesus answers, no one can show greater love than to lay down his life for his friend. And I did that, Jesus can say. Jesus gave us a commandment that he himself had first fulfilled. And then thirdly, Jesus called or has chosen us to be his friends. The way that Jesus addresses the issue of status is interesting. Essentially, the image of servant is abandoned in favor of one abiding friendship. Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves or servants, but I call you friends. While the language of serving and servitude has dominated Christian tradition, this little correction deserves more reflection. Perhaps it means that God does not want slaves, but rather companions. It creates a different model of spirituality. Of course, friendship also means letting the other be, and this is the keen thing about friendship. It means letting the other person be, and acknowledging that otherness in its integrity and its sacredness. Certainly, there's no thought of trying to pocket God or Jesus in a way which reduces either, a kind of power play which makes the person manageable, pocketable, and in my control. Some people, unfortunately, either want to dominate or to be dominated. They live lives as if it's either or. The model here is different. It does not compromise the integrity or holiness of the other, but affirms companionship in such holiness. We are not just asked to be friends. We are friends for a purpose. We are friends to bear fruit in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus chose us to be ambassadors. He has chosen us to send us out. He, he did not choose us to sit on our good intentions. He chose us to sit out and to be sent out to represent him in the world. Jesus, I like to say, chose us to be advertisements. He chose us to go out to bear fruit, which will stand the test of time. The way to spread Christianity is to be a Christian who abides in Jesus' love. The way to bring others into the Christian faith is to show others the fruit of the Christian life. 
Jesus sends us out not to argue people into Christianity or to threaten people into Christianity, but to attract people by abiding in Jesus' love, which is bearing fruits. In scripture, hospitality reflects a larger reality than mere survival. I'm afraid that many of our churches today want to use hospitality or the sign of hospitality just to try to survive in the church. It links us, however, hospitality scripturally links us to each other and to God. It is understood as a way of, of meeting and receiving the holy presence of God. Sure, it was risky then and probably even more risky than it is today, but it was the expectation. It was that what we're called to do, do is to meet God in every face we encounter. It doesn't mean that we all have to like each other or even get along. A stranger is still a stranger, but we are called to recognize that running beneath all our lives is a common humanity and a common creator. It's not about overcoming differences, but rather transcending them and being reconciled to one another in love. And our love for each other reflects our love for God. And letting each of us be who we are is letting God be God. The last verses in our text today say, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So the Father will give you whatever you ask him in his name. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Jesus chose us to be privileged members of the family of God. And he charges us to go and abide in his love. God bless you. Our hymn is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, 415. Let's sing it.
you for those who are online and those who've gathered for this service celebrating our our graduates. And we do have some in the house. Uh, identify yourself if you are one such graduate now. All right. Amen. I close with this benediction. It's framed from the words of Reverend Dr. William Sloan Coffin. I count it as a charge by which I try to live my life. And as you go from this place, may it be one that guides you in your ministry. As we go from this place, may God grant you the grace never to sell yourself short, the courage to risk something big for something good, and the wisdom to know that the world is too large for anything but the truth and too small for anything but love. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.